It's going to be great in heaven, amen? amen? You know, when we get to heaven, they're not going to be separate clouds for the Atlanta or the Paris churches. There's not going to be a London cloud. There's not going to be a Stockholm cloud. There's not going to be a San Paulo cloud. There's not going to be a mainline cloud. There's not going to be a Boston cloud. But there will simply be one kingdom, eternal and universal. Amen? Amen. It's going to be great to be in heaven. Amen? Amen. In Acts chapter 6, we meet a brother who waited for God to raise him up by waiting on tables. This man was said to be full of the Holy Spirit. And if he was full of the Holy Spirit, then that's the only thing that was in him. He was simply full of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. He realized that God would raise him into leadership in God's own time. And the latter parts of chapter 6, we find that his time comes. For all of us, our time comes, doesn't it? In Acts chapter 6, we find that he is preaching the word with power and grace. Stephen is arrested for blasphemy and is taken before the powerful governing body of the Sanhedrin. We begin in Acts chapter 7, in verse 1. Then the high priest asked Stephen, Are these charges true? To this he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Iran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land that I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even a foot of ground. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no children. God spoke to him in this way. Your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, God said. And afterward, they will come out of that country and worship me in that place. We find that to begin the address before the Sanhedrin, he calls for his brother's full attention. And he says, brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. And he goes on and tells the promise, the magnificent, fantastic promise that God gave to Abraham. That his descendants would bless all the nations of the world. And Stephen goes through the history of the Jewish people and shows that God always wanted to raise up a people to be his own. That God was always moving to bring man back to him. But every time that God reached out, every time that God sent his prophet, his messenger, man rejected the prophet's rejected the prophet's words, and thus rejected God's. He tells about Moses, how Moses tried, at first when he was 40 years old, to rescue the Hebrew people by killing one of the Egyptians that was mistreating one of the Hebrew slaves. But it simply says in verse 25, Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. The people were blind. He then went 40 years out into the wilderness as a shepherd. And then his time came. 
God appeared to him in a burning bush and gave him the commission to go back to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let God's people go. He brought them out. But in bringing them out, there was once more rebellion against Moses, once more rebellion against God's word, and thus they rejected God. And so he concludes in verse 51, You stiff necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. This is not the beginning of how to win friends and influence people right here. You stiff necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. You are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit has always been. Amen. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You have received the law that was put into effect through the angels, but have not obeyed it. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. The Bible says that when they heard the word of God, they were furious. They gnashed their teeth. And then when Stephen looked up and saw Jesus stand at the right hand of God and the glory of God, the same glory of God that appeared to Abraham. You see, the God of Abraham was the God of Stephen and is our God today. Amen. Amen. And God wants his glory to show once again. He says, I see the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And that just did it. They rushed him, took him outside the city. And began to stone him. In Stephen's message, the Sanhedrin, 18 times he mentions the word God. His mention to the Sanhedrin, three times he says that God is Lord, and one time calls him the Most High. It was a God centered message, it was a message of God. And yet they rejected it. And he asked them, why do you resist the Spirit? Why do you resist God's Word? Why do you resist the movement of God in our day, he says. You know, we have got to address this issue. Is there such thing as a movement of God? I believe there is. Amen? Amen. But the question's got to come. How does God move? How does God work? Turn to Isaiah chapter 10. In verse 20, Isaiah writes, In that day the remnant of Israel, the survivors of the house of Jacob, will no longer rely on him who struck them down, but will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. A remnant will return, a remnant of Jacob will return to the mighty God. Though your people, O Israel, be like the sand by the sea, only a remnant will return. I put before you that God has always worked through a remnant. You know, very interestingly, I wrote an article a few weeks ago about the remnant that's being called out in the city of Atlanta. And you talk about people being furious, gnashing their teeth. I mean, we're talking major furious right here. They were upset. What do you mean remnant? What is a remnant? Well, it's right here in Isaiah chapter 10. It says in verse 20 that the definition of a remnant are simply the survivors of what was God's people. He says, in that day, the remnant of Israel, the survivors of the house of Jacob. In other words, a remnant are those people with great hearts that have been called out of what were known as God's people in that day. God has always worked through a remnant. I believe with all of my heart 
there is a movement of God that God desires for every generation. Amen? Amen. This is what Stephen preached, and so that's our first point. The movement of God. What were the remnants that God worked through? Remember, he started with Adam and Eve. And he told them to be fruitful and multiply and to fill up the earth. Sound familiar? We got the same charge, just spiritually speaking. Amen? Amen. They were able to do it. Can we do it? Yes. Let's run by again. Can we do it? Yes. But we've got to be fruitful and multiply. And yet their fruit was bad. Because there were all wickedness in the world, except for eight people. Come on, brother, are you saying that only eight people in the whole world were saved back then? Yes. And the Bible says that they were saved through water. That's tempting, but I'm not going to plunge in at the moment. <laughs> only eight were saved. That was the remnant that God worked through. Then hundreds of years later, the people of God, the Hebrews, increased mightily in number in Egypt. God sends Moses to bring them out of Egypt. The Bible says there were 650,000 fighting men. That means there were probably two million people that came out of Egypt and walked through dry ground on the Red Sea. I mean, if you've ever seen the Ten Commandments, it's pretty awesome. Amen. I mean, incredible. They didn't just sort of eke out five or six people got in a boat and they went on to Israel. I mean, we're talking God right here. We're talking movement of God. And yet after their wilderness wanderings, only two families were allowed to enter the promised land. Just two out of millions. A remnant. And yet it was around this remnant that the whole promised land was taken. Amen? Amen. You see, out of what was God's people, those with great hearts are called by God, by the Holy Spirit, and they do God's task in that day. David had a remnant, so to speak. The people that were drawn to David were an interesting group. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 22 that the men that came to David were those in debt those distressed, and those discontented. Sound like your interns? <laughs> Seriously, though, I believe that there are a lot of people out there, yes, in the religious world, but I put before you in the churches of Christ who are spiritually in debt, spiritually distressed, spiritually discontented, that one to come to David who represents the Messiah and it's time to build the remnant of God in our generation. Amen? Amen? Because, you see, after a period of time of walking with David, they became the mighty men of God. Another very famous remnant God worked through. Yes, things became great in Israel for a while, but then there was division and strife and hatred and sin. And so, both Israel and Judah were exiled in 722 B.C. and 586 B.C., respectively. They were taken all the way to Babylon. And then after 70 years, God called Nehemiah and a remnant back to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. They brought back these exiles. And of course, this is what Isaiah is really talking about right here. They came back because of a mighty God. Amen. And so out of those people that were no one as God's people, the ones that didn't get comfortable in Babylon, God took the great hearted and made a remnant out of them and rebuilt his people. The most famous remnant of all time, though, is one that a lot of people don't see too often. And that is a remnant that was forged in the first century. That remnant was called... Christianity. See, the people of God in those days were known as the Jews. And out of the Jews, in the preaching of God's Word by John the Baptist and Jesus Christ as the Word incarnate, amen, those that wanted to follow Jesus then were called out and a new remnant began. The Church of Jesus Christ. 
But you know, I think there's some real misunderstandings of what it really means to be a part of a remnant, to be called by God. Now, let's face it, on the day of Pentecost, not all those people who wanted to be part of the remnant became part of the remnant that day. More and more and more of the Jews became part of the remnant. Amen? But bottom line, there was a remnant that began Christianity. That is how God has always worked to build a movement. A few men who are willing to give everything to the cause. I think we need to get straight. Who are these men? It's not the people that Stephen was speaking to. He says, you are stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart. But you know, there's an expression that goes around there, oh, he's a good person. And often we say, oh, he's a good hearted person because we say he's a good moral person. Listen, there's all the difference in the world between being good hearted and simply being a good person. The Bible says that when Jesus preached the word to prostitutes, these were bad people. Some of them became Christians. When the word of God was applied to their life, even though they were bad lifestyles, morally speaking, they were good hearted because they responded and repented. Amen. And yet when he preached to Pharisees who were good, moral people, they resisted the Holy Spirit of God. They were good people, but they were not good hearted. We got to get on straight. You cannot tell what someone's heart is like on the outside. The only way to tell what someone's heart is like is to apply the word of God to them. And so this is what was done. God literally applied the living word of God to all the house of Israel in the first century. And those with great hearts, not necessarily great moral eyes, but those with great hearts became the remnant known as Christianity. Amen. Amen. I believe, though, that God has been trying to move in every generation. You see flickerings of the Holy Spirit at the times like the Reformation with Martin Luther. And yet, because of the incredible condemnation that forcefully preaching that you are saved by faith would have brought in that day, Martin Luther and many of the people that were trying to follow him in that day refused to take the kind of stand it took to change the world. And the Reformation was delegated to mostly a movement throughout Europe. We saw flickerings of the Holy Spirit in the 1700s with the first and second great awakening with the Wesley brothers and others. Of course, the movement that perhaps is most dear to most of us in the audience here tonight is what we call the Reformation Movement. Men in the late 1700s in England and America began to say, listen, we don't want to be Methodists or Baptists or Presbyterians. We just simply want to be Christians and Christians only. Sounds great. Amen? Amen. Just to go by the Bible. And so men like Kelly in Virginia and Abner and Jones in New England, Barton Stone in Kentucky and Thomas and Alexander Campbell came together and forged what we call the Christian connection. Simply being Christian and going by the Word of God and the Word of God only. Well, very interesting, about 1812, Alexander Campbell, who becomes the primary mover in this movement. And you always got to have a mover. Amen. Amen. He becomes the primary mover. He, he has a son in 1812. And he says, I don't know whether we should baptize him as an infant. And so he studies and he studies himself out of infant baptism. He says, well, we've got to immerse and immerse solely adults. And so Alexander Campbell himself was immersed in 1813. However, 10 years later, he's in a very famous debate called the McCullough debate. And for the first time, he put before the religious world that baptism, yes, as an adult by immersion, was for the purpose of the remission of sins. It blew the Baptist away. And what happened was, is this furor, this incredible gnashing of teeth throughout the religious world. And so many people said, this is too much, too strong. And even Alexander Campbell himself, after debating a Catholic bishop a few years later, said, well, this Catholic bishop is so good, so moral. God must really love him. Maybe you can't totally always apply the fact that you've got to be baptized for remission of sins as an adult. He backed off out of sentimentality. He backed off because he didn't understand remnants. Alexander himself was never baptized again for the purpose of the remission of sins. He felt it was okay if you retroactively understood it. I'm not going to say where Alexander Campbell stands before God. God will judge. Amen. Amen. But let me tell you something. When I read my Bible, you must be baptized for the remission of sins, understanding that. 
It is the truth of God. It doesn't make any difference how many or how few believe it. You know, if we were to take a vote every time an issue of God or truth of God were at stake, what would have happened at the Red Sea if they would have taken a vote about whether they wanted to go forwards? It wouldn't have been a good outcome, wouldn't it? You know, we have a voting mentality in the Church of Christ today, and that is not in God's words. The church is not a democracy. That's because we've been so influenced by America. The church is a kingdom. It is a kingdom. It is the kingdom of God on earth. That is fantastic. But we've got to understand that, yes, Alexander Campbell's a great man of faith. He brought us a distance. But he didn't take it all the way because of sentimentality and afraid to, quote, unquote, turn off too many people. My greatest fear at this hour is that so many of us are sentimental towards what we call the restoration movement and, quote, unquote, the churches of Christ that we are afraid to take restoration all the way back and to go by the Bible and the Bible only. Let me tell you something. No matter how few people follow, I am determined to take it all the way back. Amen? Amen. Here's the bottom line, brothers and sisters. We have got to understand the concept of remnant. We cannot back off. We cannot compromise. We've got to speak the truth in love. And yes, wisely, but we've got to stand up for the truth. Amen? Amen. I'm not saying that everybody in the Church of Christ is lost. But I am saying there's a lot of deadness out there. Let's just be honest. I'm not condemning. I'm just saying let's just be honest. But see, we are so close to mentality, we don't want to wake the people up. I am so thankful Stephen stood up and said what had to be said. He said, you're uncircumcised in heart. You're stiff-necked. You're hard-hearted. You're resisting the Spirit of God. That's what he said. I fear that too many in here want to restore the restoration movement. I'm not here to do that. I am here to restore New Testament Christianity according to the Bible. How about you? Amen. We have a decision to make at this hour. Is God moving in our generation? Did God move in Gainesville, Florida, in the small group of Christians that the Lord began to work through in ignorance, in mistake, in abuse, and yet that's the Lord, amen, took, took men of faith like Brother Whitehead, Brother Bartley, and Chuck, and Sam, and they began to look at the scriptures and try to implement what they saw. Many years later, and you'll have to make a decision, I believe that God picked the Boston Church. A group of 50 people that were meeting in Lexington, Massachusetts. You know why I picked them? Because they were so desperate. One of the elders had gotten up and says, maybe if, if we just keep going down and down and down, we're going to die. And that's what happens when you start decreasing numbers and decreasing numbers and decreasing numbers. You die. They got so desperate. I mean, we're talking mega, radical, ultra, super desperate. They hired a guy from Charleston, Illinois, to be their minister. 25 years old, prideful as anybody you've ever seen. But even God could use someone like that. Amen? Amen. Thank God that he can use even prideful people. In eight years, you're going to have to make a decision. Was it God or the collective brilliance and talents of Bob Gimple and Stan Moorhead and Kit McKean and Elena and Pat, the, the awesome intellectual genius and the super expertise in studying out the details of the New Testament patterns that allowed an eight-year period of time a church of 50 to be a church of 3,000 every Sunday morning in the Boston Garden. Was it of God or was it of man? You must make a decision. You know, one year ago at the World Mission Seminar, 
to this day to date, there have been over a thousand baptisms in the Boston Church. Yeah. I believe. That, my friends, to my knowledge, is the first time in Restoration history. But we're just beginning. You're going to have to make a decision then. Was it the Holy Spirit that sent out the Chicago church, or was it the creative genius of Marty and Brother Holt and Brother Wooten and Roger that forged the Chicago church to be the largest, fastest-growing church in the Midwest? It's got to be God. I'm convinced. It's got to be God. In five years, it's become the largest, fastest-growing church in the Midwest. But now they're multiplying. They've sent out their first church planning in January to Minneapolis, St. Paul. In the first six months there, they've had 60 baptisms. Amen. God is moving. God is moving not only in Minneapolis, but they have their second church planting in St. Louis. God is moving. Then five years ago as well, we sent the group to London, England. Nine Christians. Douglas and James numbered amongst them. This creative mass of talent, genius, expertise, humility has now become, in five years' time, the largest and fastest growing congregation outside the United States. They've also multiplied, have their first church planting in Australia, and the first six months there, they've seen 60 people baptized. You've got to make a decision. Is that of God or is it of man? In four years, the church planting in New York City has become has become the second fastest growing Church of Christ in all the world in four years. They've got their first church planting in San Paulo, Brazil. In the first three months, 24 people have been baptized in Christ. Is that of God or is it of man? Providence planted two years ago. It's now the second largest church in New England behind Boston. Is this of God or of man? Toronto planted two years ago. It's now the largest and fastest growing church in all of Canada. The church in Johannesburg. The church in Johannesburg planted one year ago in a place where blacks and whites couldn't get together because of diplomacy. They couldn't get together because of technology. They couldn't get together because of education. They couldn't even get together because of religion. But in one year's time, God, through Doug and Daphne Leike, Steve Richards, Gary and Gail Newton, all the others of the 24 that bravely went, had 70 baptisms the first year. Black and white are together for the first time in the history of South Africa. Black and white are together. There's a great light that's rising out of South Africa that all the world will know that these are Christ's disciples because they love one another. Amen. Is that of God or of man? They are now the fastest growing church in Africa. Paris. The team went out less, about a year ago. The fastest growing church the previous year in all of French-speaking Europe had baptized 12. They set a goal of 40 for their first year. They had 42. God is moving. In Stockholm, they went out less than a year ago. They are now, get this, the largest and fastest growing church in all of Scandinavia. God is moving. They have a church planting plan for Helsinki next year. And Helsinki is the same distance from Leningrad, Russia, as Boston is New York. Tell the Russians we're coming. Amen. In Bombay, in Bombay, last January, nine Christians came together to initiate the work there after a three-month internship. Nine Christians in the first seven months of the work there have seen almost 40 people baptized in the Christ. They're having over 100 people on Sunday morning. And get this, they are now the largest and fastest growing church in all India. However, I was, well, I, I was sent a letter. 
by a certain professor from one of the graduate schools. And he said, I will give you that they are the largest meeting group of Christians in the nation of India, one billion lost souls. He said, but when you say they're setting the pace and leading the way and being the fastest growing, that can't be. I mean, there are people that go in there in two weeks and baptize 2,000. I said, well, yes, brother, but the way that I count baptisms are people who make the decision to be a disciple first and then come to church later. <laughs> Let me tell you something. India is in for a bomb from Bombay. Amen? <laughs> you heard about Kingston. 48 Christians. In eight months, 80 baptisms. They're the fastest growing church in the Caribbean now. God is moving. We've reconstructed the work in San Francisco. Tom Brown laid a beautiful foundation. Scott Green went there this summer. In the last 50 days, they've had 100 people baptized in Christ and will become the San Francisco Church in September. Amen. Atlanta. Atlanta is a planting. Atlanta is a planting. There was opposition in the Atlanta Highlands Church. They didn't believe in the authority of the evangelists. They didn't want to have discipleship partners. They didn't want to be totally unified in mind and thought with the leadership. And so there was opposition. Should that surprise us? No. Why do you resist the Spirit? I think it's a lot out of sentimentality. But 260 said, along with Sam Lang and Andy Lindo, we want a discipling multiplying church for Atlanta that's going to be the pillar church for Southeast. 260 members. Their very first service had 813 people there. They had a budget of 10000 They had $20,000 given that day. Is that of God or is that of man? I believe it's of God. Their internships now in Mexico City, Buenos Aires, Hong Kong, and Tokyo. God is moving. I believe that with all of my heart. In eight years from Boston, we now have great multiplying churches on every populated continent of the world. We have a decision. Is this a movement of God? Or is this a collective genius and talent of well-organized men? Are the men that have gone simply well-educated, charismatic, PhDs like Henry Crete, who have used what they've been given by the world to form great semi-Amway organizations. Let me tell you something. I believe that the evangelists are of God. They are not of man. They are of God. They're not hired by the church. They're of God. Their authority is from God. They preach the word. That's of God. You have a decision to make. Stephen in his day said, look guys, look what God has done from Abraham through Joseph, through Moses. Why do you resist the Holy Spirit in your day? Wake up, look and see the glory of God. It's here now. Brothers and sisters, look, it's here now. The world is already hearing the message of Jesus Christ. There is a movement of God in our generation. Let me tell, let me tell you people something. And you'd best all say, Amen. Those under the spell of darkness live in confusion. Remember that in just one lifetime, the world was turned upside down. Just a ragged band of men went out into Jerusalem one day and shouted out in every tongue words he sent them to say. Three thousand souls agreed, and so the work just begun. And that on Pentecost beginning was just like a starting gun. Only a few weeks earlier, the Lord was crucified. Now on every corner in Jerusalem, it seems the Lord is multiplied. The message spread to hungry hearts like seeds scattered in the breezes. And now there's just not one to kill, but there are 3,000 Jesuses. Upside down, the world needs shaken. Rattle the cages. There's chains that need a breaking. 2,000 years, and here we are. A world of waste and screams. But just a ragged band of men can reawaken all the dreams. There's a way to take this planet and change everything around, or a better way to say it is, let's turn the whole thing upside down.
Not only did Stephen believe in the movement of God, he had a message from God. What does the Spirit say to the churches? August 28, 1987. The same thing that he said through the ages. Love God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love God. That's the message. In Psalm 63 and verse 3, David says, I love God even more than I love my life. Turn to Psalm chapter 5. From David in verse 3. Morning by morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. Morning by morning, I lay my request before you and wait in expectation. He said, every morning, Lord, I get with you. Just morning by morning, I'm pumped. I have a reason to get out of bed. I hate to sleep in because morning by morning, I'm with you. I pray and then I wait in expectation. Now, that's a quiet time. You know, one of the most beautiful things about children is their purity and understanding of God. They wait in expectation. My son, Sean, whom so many of you prayed about, he's doing great. He's one of the most pure-hearted little kids I've ever seen. His prayers are really prayers to God. He, he knows he's talking to God. I get a kick out of it. You know, you can always tell when someone's talking to God, really. But Sean, he, he talks to God. We had the privilege, four or five months ago, to have one of Elena's brothers, George, come by the house. And George wasn't a Christian. And we had a family devotional. We just have a rip-roaring, fun family devotional. That's what family devotionals need to be all about, right? The Lord's fun. And then we went to the dinner table. And usually I have to coach Sean, but I, I said, Sean, why don't you do the prayer? Now, for those that know Sean, he's got the deepest voice any little kid ever has. He starts out, he goes, Dear God, Thank you so much for Daddy, Mommy, Livia, Eric, Juana. That's the girl that lives with us. And thank you so much for Uncle George. Please help Uncle George become a Christian soon. <laughs> and God, make the food good. <laughs> Amen. And he, you got to know Sean, he looked up to me and he had those eyes. Those eyes that just wanted your approval. Well, during the prayer, I'm sitting there, and please help George become a Christian. I mean, this, this is uncomfortable. You ever, you ever been there, an uncomfortable moment? Your kid has just told the person there he's not a Christian, and things are, things are you know, you're, you say, Sean, come on, keep going. Maybe he'll just forget or something. Sean, just keep going. And, and you know, you, you, it's real uncomfortable, and you really don't want him to say amen and have to look up. You know what I mean? Anyway, he said amen. I looked up. I, I couldn't look at you. I just looked at Sean. There was Sean, just with a smile. <laughs> Daddy, did I do good? You know, and I just gave him the nod. And, and I didn't know what to say. I just sort of turned slowly to Peter. Elena sort of turned slowly, excuse me, to George. And he says, well, Sean just likes to preach when he prays. <laughs> See, he prayed with expectation. Two months later... George was baptized in Christ. Amen. He's here with us tonight. I'm going to ask George right here to stand up. There he is right here. That's the latest brother, George. The answer to Sean's prayers of expectation. I got a question. We say we're a movement of God. Then we're to be spiritual men. Stephen was a man full of the Spirit. It's recorded three times. He is full of the Spirit. I got a question. This morning, here at the World Mission Seminar, a mountaintop experience, did you have an awesome quiet time? Did you have an awesome quiet time? Raise your hand if you did. Be honest.
I want us to look around how few that really is. You people that don't raise your hands, you scare me. You really scare me. We're to be of God. And here in the mountaintop experience, you don't get with the God in the morning. You scare me. You really scare me. Our movement can be stopped. Not from the outside. No newspaper article. No reporter. No TV. No amount of persecution can stop God. But God will not bless people that do not know Him and are with Him in spirit. That's why Paul says, pray in the spirit on all occasions, Ephesians 6. There are three ways the movement of God can be stopped in this generation. Number one is sin. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. If we become filled with sin, there will be a cloud of unrighteousness hanging over our churches. And we will not grow. God will not bless it. We will resist the Spirit. We'll become blind to the truth of God's Word. Number two, the second thing that will stop the movement is fear. Cowardliness. Cowardliness to share our faith, but cowardliness to stand up for the truth. However few that makes. We always talk about building bridges, building bridges, building bridges. Let me tell you something. You better build a bridge you can stand on. Because too many people have been trying to build bridges with people that don't want them built. And they crashed in the soup of lukewarmness. Sementality will kill us. That's what fear really is and can become a sentimentality. We don't want to take a hard line stand for the truth. Number three, traditions. Oh yeah, we preach that we have hard traditions. But I don't know too many groups that are as plagued with tradition as much. And we even call them the traditional churches of Christ. That's scary. You know, we've restored so much. We've come so far. We don't think we have to meet in church buildings anymore. Amen. We're willing to call people to be committed and not just suggest it. We're willing to say that the evangelist, without elders in the congregation, is the authority of God in the congregation. The only time he's not to be obeyed is when he calls you to disobey Scripture or disobey your conscience. And even if he calls you to do something to disobey your conscience, you still have an obligation to study it out and prayerfully to change your opinion. So you can be totally unified. Take this issue of clapping of hands. I mean, you know, black churches don't have any problems with clapping hands. Why? Because they like to have fun when they sing. You know, the white folk, though, I mean, man, you know, you know you, it's sometimes bad being white, you know? I mean, the black preachers get all the fun stuff. I mean, the black people get to sing so awesomely. And here we whites are, stuck in the mud.
And here we whites are, stuck in the mud, and God forbid we clap. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> you won't believe it. Some people think it's a musical instrument. Listen, some of you are so out of time, it can't be a musical instrument. <laughs> but see, that's the beauty of the church. If we don't believe in a black church or a white church, we believe in one church in every city. We've come a long way. We've got a long way to go. Doug blew us away last night. That poverty issue. I pray you repented last night. And your leaders have already begun to forge plans for massive contributions. We've come so far. Don't not walk with God. You scare me. Love, God, why do you resist the Spirit and don't have your quiet time and walk with God? What does the Spirit say to the church, August 28, 1987? Not only love God, but love the lost. In Acts 6, 9 through 10, it says that Stephen spoke with the Spirit, the strength of which no one could withstand. You know, I am convinced that that was the Holy Spirit that those men could not withstand. Amen. You see, I believe all my heart the Holy Spirit loves to preach. And if you're not preaching, the Holy Spirit feels sort of cooped up inside. Depressed and grieved. That's what the book says. What does the Spirit say? The church, love God. Secondly, love the lost. In Romans 2, verses 12 to 16, we have a very important question answered for us. Who are the lost? Who are the lost? The Bible says that those under law will be judged by the law, and since no one can keep the law, all will perish. Those without the law, in other words, those without the Bible, will be judged without the Bible. Now, that's fair, isn't it? And they will be judged by their consciences. But who has ever lived up to their conscience? And so, bottom line, all of them will perish, whether there are people with the Bible or without the Bible. They will perish because it says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No man deserves salvation. Who is lost? Number one, the atheists are lost. They don't believe in God. Number two, the polytheists are lost. Those that believe in a multiplicity of gods, like the Hindus, they're lost. What if they're good Hindus? They're lost. Goodness doesn't save you. The monotheistic religions that don't have Jesus, like Judaism and Muslimism, they're lost. But brother, they pray five times a day. They're lost. No deeds will save you. You are not saved without Jesus Christ. Denominations who even believe in Jesus but practice infant baptism or praying Jesus in your heart are lost because that's not how the Bible teaches to be saved. Now, what about what we call the Church of Christ? I believe that there are several saved people in the Church of Christ, but let me, let me make myself abundantly clear here tonight. I don't believe that they're all saved because they walk into a Church of Christ building on Sunday morning. I mean, you don't see half of them on Wednesday night. What does it take to be saved? Number one, you've got to respond to Jesus and the cross. Too many Church of Christ are just preaching baptism, be saved. We need to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Number two, you've got to be cut to the heart about your sin. You've got to know you're a sinner. You've got to know you're lost. You're separated from God. You are a wretch. You're a worm. You're gross without God. There's no good person that comes to the Lord. But you know, when we're baptizing young people, 9, 10, 11, 12, a lot of people think, well, I knew the difference between right and wrong. Hey, being convicted about sin is much more than understanding right and wrong. My daughter is six years old and understands right and wrong. Eric, too, he understands right and wrong most of the time. Understanding right and wrong is not being convicted of sin and being a sinner. 
Let me just put it this way. You didn't respond to Jesus, but you followed the plan of salvation, quote, unquote. You didn't respond to Jesus. You are still lost. You weren't convicted of your sin. In responding to Jesus, you are lost. You got to understand you're a sinner. Now, you may not be able to number all your sins. I mean, listen, we're talking long list here, folks. But you got to understand you're a sinner. I knew about my immorality and my cheating on tests, my selfishness. I knew I was a sinner. I hated it. I loved God. I really did. But I, I was a gross sinner before God. Number three, people must be called to repent. They must be called to turn away from sin. If there is no change of life, then there is no repentance. Not only do you turn away from something, but you turn to making Jesus Lord. The Bible says in John 4, 1, that Jesus gained and baptized disciples. That's what the book says. I think that's what we need to do too. Amen? That terminology has thrown some people, but, but here's what it means. And Jesus makes it clear in Matthew 28. You've got to make disciples. You've got to, at least one second before baptism, make the decision to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and then be baptized. It cannot be a retroactive understanding. Or in our terminology in the olden days, like at Crossroads, we said, make Jesus Lord over everything, everyone, every possession, every dream, every focus of your life. If Jesus isn't Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. But let's get back to Bible terminology. Let's restore Bible terminology. And from here on in, we're going to talk about us gaining and baptizing disciples. Amen? Amen. If Jesus did it, that's what we got to do. And they need to be baptized. They need to be immersed, understanding it's for forgiveness of sins, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I think we need to preach this lesson. Let's not be afraid of it. If this is the truth, let's preach it. Amen? Amen. Why do you resist the Spirit and not want to talk about your baptism? Why are you uncomfortable talking about your baptism? You're resisting the Spirit. I want to challenge everyone in here. I know we all take I want to challenge everyone in here to make a decision to repent tonight to love the lost more than you ever have before because you appreciate your salvation more than you ever have before tonight. You know, one person I think is such a great example of this is Elena. I love my wife Elena so much. She has been what I need. She's so pure-hearted. And I'm not naturally that way. And God's changing me through His Holy Spirit, through Bob and Al, through Elena and through Pat and Gloria and so many others like Douglas and Steve and James and Martin and Phil and all the ones I love so much. Hey, everybody needs to be discipled. By God and by a man in your life if you're a man and a woman if you're a woman. Don't give me this garbage. You can live the Christian life solo. You know, Elena's done so much. She loves the law so much. I don't know of anybody in any ministry, and I have sometimes a tendency to be given to exaggeration. Sometimes. That's what Douglas tells me, at least. But I honestly, I don't know anybody in any congregation that's been as fruitful in their neighborhood as Elena. It allows me to really be fruitful in the neighborhood, which is great. And I appreciate that. But you know, she so much loves the lost because she loves the Lord. Look at the sisters that she sent out in Erica, Lynn Green, Donna Lamb, Carmen Bentley, Ann Turnbull, Joyce Arthur. I mean, these sisters are testimony alone of the life. And of course, the young woman that I appreciate so much, she's having great influence on, is Olivia. See, Olivia loves the lost. Now, she's a little bit shy, but she loves the lost. And it's been really cool because we as a family have been working together to be evangelistic. The Browns have been in our Bible talk this summer. And it's been so much fun to be with Tom and Kelly. We love them so much. We've been having a blast in the Bible talk. That's what Bible talks are about, having fun. Amen. In evangelism, fun. Amen. And it's been so great because Olivia reached out to this little girl in a gymnastics class called Heather Honeycutt. And so Lynn and I got to know her parents, Rodney and Dee Honeycutt. We invited them to church a couple of times and then started to love them to get in a relationship with them, and finally I was able to set up a study with them. But before I set up the study, I talked to Rodney, and Rodney was more open than Dee. And I said, Rodney, tell me just a little bit about yourself. He says, well, he says, I don't tell a lot of people this, but I'm a professor at Harvard. 
Um, mm, boy, this is going to take a little bit longer than just the summer. This is a long term one, I think. Well, uh, Rodney, what's your uh, field of expertise? What's your field of study? He said, evolutionary biology. Uh, mm. Boy, uh, we're talking uh, major project here. Uh, this one calls for Tom Brown and me both. I think this is that, yeah, that's, that's it. We studied with him two times a week. Got into a daily relationship, challenged, got out the scriptures, taught about Jesus. He came to faith in Jesus, came to faith in the Word. And five weeks later, in the first of August, he made the decision to be baptized, and he's your brother now. Five days later, his wife, Dee, was baptized in Christ, too. Amen. It was so beautiful seeing Rodney baptize her into Christ. That's where our joy is at. Never get away from evangelism. There's so much joy and happiness as we share our faith in Jesus Christ. You see, sharing our faith is not just for the lost, it's for us. Because when we share our faith, we're reminded of the good news. If you're not out there sharing your faith, you're not reminding yourself of the good news. That's why so many of you are dead. You've not loved lost. That's what the Spirit says. Why do you resist the Spirit and not bring visitors to Bible talk? Question. How many people here have been personally fruitful this year since January 1st. Raise your hand. The rest of you guys scare me. You really scare me. We're supposed to be the people of God who love God. Realize the world's lost. You scare me. Repent. Why do you resist the Spirit? And not be bold. Thirdly, what is the message of God? Not only love God, not only love the lost, but to love the brotherhood. 1 Peter 2, 17. I believe it's only when you love God and only when your focus is straight in loving the lost can you love the brotherhood. You've got to go in the same direction. You see, if you're in a movement of God, you've got to be moving. And that's pretty good, isn't it? If you're in a movement of God, you've got to be moving. Amen? Amen? I think it's time to pick up the movement. You know, God has been working in so many great ways. I've been alarmed in the last few years the divisiveness that's been coming into the discipling ministry. Let's just lay it out. We're family here. We're family. I've been very alarmed by the vices that's come into the discipling ministries. It's scary. One church recently told me, well, we preach a different message than you guys in Boston now. Oh, that's scary. That really scares me. But you know... God is trying to forge a remnant. Not only is he calling people in from the mainline church, we've got to pull these people in. Amen? And we cannot sit idly by while there are dead churches there, folks. It's time to pull them on in. And there's the vision between us and the mainline church because, as it says in 1 Corinthians 11, there's got to be division so which ones of us have God's approval. But God has been working through two very incredible leaders of God, humble men. Tom Brown, leader in Berkeley Church, said, listen, it's just not multiplying out here. Oh, we're having additions in our church. It's not multiplying. You know what multiply means? Having more and more baptisms every year. That's what multiplying is. Additions when you've got about the same amount and you're going down. He says, listen. I need to get into discipling relationship. I cannot do it on my own. No one can do it on their own. Everybody needs ongoing discipleship. You're a disciple of God till you die, and you're a disciple of someone else till you die. Timothy didn't quit being a disciple of Paul after he was with him for a few years. He said, well, toodles, Paul. I'm going to do it my own way. I probably can take it a little bit higher. You know, I think you're a little bit rough there in some of those spots. Should have been a little bit warmer to the Galatians. Tom Brown said, I need to be disciples. Then he said, I need to move to Boston for a couple of months and learn. Same time we sent Scott Green. Things really cranked out there. There, is a, there was a difference. Tom Brown came here. A lot of healing took place in Kelly, and great things began to happen. They really wanted to stay in Boston. They want someone from Boston going out and direct the work. And come September 13th, Frank Kim's going to be the new evangelist out there directing what will become now the San Francisco Church. In the meantime, in the meantime, God was working at the Atlanta Leadership Conference. 
And there were a lot of things said by a lot of brothers, like we got to repent of our pride, repent of our criticalness. Sam Lane led the way with a powerful message. I was moved to tears when Sam said, I'm back. I said, Amen. And uh, then we talked to Sam. I said, Brother, you need help. You need training. Let us go down there and help in the Atlanta church. Sam said, Okay, I'm ready to move. When Tom and Sam said, Listen, we're ready to move, sort of the feeling out there in the other discipling ministries that weren't even going as well, those were sort of the standout ones, said, Well, if they're going, there goes our excuse. It's amazing how God uses desperation, isn't it? I am convinced, though, with Sam's and Tom's moving to Boston, God is forging a brotherhood once again. One body, one church universal. The Boston church has targeted the great cities of the United States. New York, Chicago, Providence here in New England. Along with San Francisco and Atlanta that we're directing and replanting, respectively. We've targeted Washington, D.C., we've recently targeted Miami, it needs to be, and we targeted Los Angeles. We're working with the San Diego leadership right now. They want discipling from Boston, and Marty and I are in a discipling relationship there in Denver. What's happening now is that there are networks of relationships that are beginning to be forming in the United States. New York is close to Chicago because Steve does like Marty and Roger. Providence is close to San Francisco because Terry does like Frank. Atlanta is close to D.C. because Andy likes Russ, who's going there, and so on down the line. And there is a network that's beginning to be formed. There's actually a brotherhood that's starting to evolve. Are you getting a picture? Are you getting excited? But it's not just here in the United States. It's not just here in the United States. We're talking about, we have part of the key cities in the world. It's not by accident. I believe the Holy Spirit has guided us. We've got the guys in London. They're in relationship with the guys in Chicago. The guys in Paris are also in relationship with the guys in London. The guys in Stockholm relationship with the guys in London. The guys in Johannesburg are in relationship with the guys in Stockholm. The guys in Bombay are in relationship with the guys in Hong Kong. The guys in Hong Kong are in relationship with the guys in Mexico City. The guys in Mexico City are in relationship with the guys in Buenos Aires. And so on and so on. Do you see what's beginning to happen? Networks of relationships between leaders that are truly forming one family, one body, one church universal in our day. God is moving. Amen. Amen. Someone says... It looks a little like the Catholic Church to me. You haven't been in a Catholic Church service recently, I don't think. <laughs> Leadership in the Kingdom of God is not by position, but by relationship. You see, it's not that these guys are stationed in position. It's a matter of relationship. Discipling. Look at the network of relationships in the New Testament church that forged them together. All we're doing is restoring New Testament Christianity. You say, well, it's different than we used to do it a few years ago. Amen. You know, Jesus is incredible. It seemed like he would wait till the Sabbath before he'd heal somebody. I mean, he went out of his way to smash tradition. And we want to tread softly when it comes to tradition. Let me tell you something. I'm glad it's different than it was 30 years ago. I'm glad that it's different than what it was 20 years ago. It needs to be different, and we still need to change and grow. We need open minds, open hearts, and open Bibles right now. But we have been called to love the brotherhood. Amen? Amen. What are the challenges to do it? Number one, if you're not in the discipling ministry, you need to move to one. Why do you resist the Spirit and not move? Do you love your house? Do you love the weather there? Do you love your worldly friends? Why do you resist the Spirit and do not move? Number two, to have a universal brotherhood, we cannot be critical of each other. Yes, some churches are stronger than others. But there is no best. We have got to all be one. Amen. Amen. We have got to really deal with this. We have a mindset in America of good, better, best. Let me tell you something. We are all children of God. I love Sean. I love Eric. I love Olivia. Don't make me choose. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to lay it out. Even between the Boston church plantings, there's ungodly comparisons. Some of the fields the guys are going in are not as, strong, not as open. That doesn't mean all fields are open. Amen? Amen? 
But take Kingston and Paris. Kingston, with Jimmy wasn't fully trained, only had four other people with him. They had 80 baptisms in eight months. The guys in Paris have worked hard. They're better group, better trained. It's hard there. They had 42 the first year. I know that God has worked. They've worked all equally hard. Let's hold both their arms on up. Amen? Let's not be critical. Secondly, the teams we've sent out are different strengths, different numbers, different numbers of interns. The ones in America have the advantage of move-ins, and that's great. But don't compare New York and London. New York is doing fantastic. Let me tell you something. Let's just praise God for New York. Amen. Amen. But let's praise God for London. Oh, we just praise God. See, the guys in London don't have all the move-ins New York has. I'm not cutting out New York. New York is going fabulously. It's the fastest growing of all the Boston church plantings. Amen. And someday, churches like New York and Mexico City and Buenos Aires and London will be bigger than Boston because they're in bigger population bases. That doesn't mean the work's not going great in Boston either. You know, we do work a little bit around here. I mean, to tell you, we got to deal with this innate, critical attitude. Get it out! We don't need it in the family. My challenge tonight is this. If you have anything, again, any church leader, any church, any person in the church, and you have not settled it by the time you go to bed tonight, you are in sin. Jesus says, settle matters quickly. Deal with any feelings, qualms, quiet reservations, bad attitudes. Let's be united when we come together, totally in the spirit, tomorrow night. Amen. Amen. Number three, we have got to call our brightest and best into the full-time work. The best hearts, the best faith, the best talents. Does that mean the others aren't more important? No, 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 no. God loves everybody. Amen. But look at the world. I mean, the business world, they want their top executives to be the five-talent guys, not the two- and three-talent guys. They appreciate them, but you need the five-talent guys on top. In medicine, they want the five-talent guys to be the surgeons. They want, I mean, you know, if someone's going to slice and dice, you want him to be semi-coordinated. The pilots, the best five-talent guys become the astronauts. They're the guttiest ones. They're the ones that want to push back the envelope. Are you with me there? We need, we don't need to wait till someone thinks they feel the Spirit calling. We know that God wants the most talented people. You know, you don't have to wait till someone feels that they need to be baptized. I mean, God wants people to be baptized. Amen? Amen. He wants the most talented to go in to the full-time work to be the leaders. That only makes sense. That's the principle of life and of God. You know, it's very interesting. I, there's a young man from Tallahassee. Came to visit Boston, see if he wanted to move here. He's a lawyer. Very successful. He'd been in law, uh, law practice for several years and done a great job. He's a real leader in his field. 29 years old. Came to Boston, was thinking about moving here, came over to my house, and he says, Kip, I'm really thinking about moving to Boston. It looks like a great spot. And besides that, I can think about maybe going into the ministry. I said, How old are you? He says, 29. I said, You're 29? Man, you're, you're starting to be in your prime there, my friend. He said, Well, I really want to see if the full time's ministry for me. I said, Man, just a little bit I've been around you, you look like you're very talented. He said, Yeah, I've always been a leader in everything I've been in. Remember what the Bible says? You bury your talents, man. You've had it. You're a wicked, lazy servant. You have the talent for leadership. My guess is God wants you to be a leader. What do you think? You're not to prostitute your leadership talents to the world. I said, Listen, I've got to give you a challenge. He said, What's that? Want me to move to Boston? Well, yes. He said, well, I was expecting that. We want to do that, my wife and I. I said, but that's not the challenge. He said, oh, what is it? He said, I want to challenge. We don't have any money in Boston right now. But I want to challenge you to sell everything you have. Use that for your support. Move to Boston and train. When? I said, well, what are you doing the next few days? He said, well, we're on vacation. I said, well, why don't you pray and fast about it on your vacation? That'd be good to think about. He says, well, wow. I, I just didn't expect... I said, listen, I'm sorry. Preston's coming right now for our discipleship part of the time. I've got I've to take it off myself. Uh, 
He said, what do I need to do? I said, listen, when you make your decision, call me. Four days later, John Bringardner decided to sell everything. He's moving to Boston. He's going into full-time ministry. Amen. Amen. We got to call our people in the full-time ministry. Tonight's decisions need to be made for the best and the most talented young men to make the decision to go full-time ministry. The best and talented young women to make the decision to be one of the counselors. Let's make the, you know what the worst that can happen to you? Fail. But has God ever failed somebody? Let's make the decision. Say, I don't know, brother, if I can. Why do you resist the Spirit? I want to challenge the American churches with four challenges. Number one, evangelize your city and evangelize your region. Number two, be willing to send members of your church to other churches that are sending out mission teams. You say, well, brother, if we send out people that's less baptism, that's right, but you've got to be kingdom-minded. We're one church, one kingdom. Amen? Number three, send nationals back to their homelands when there are churches there in those homelands. So, but they're a Bible talk leader. Amen. They're an intern. Hot diggity. Send them quick. Less baptisms, you're right, but we're building the kingdom of God. And number four, I want to challenge the American church to give money. Lots of money. Lots and lots and lots of money because you love God, you love the lost, and I believe you love the brotherhood. Amen? You need to adopt a missionary. You need to adopt the mission point. Not just give 5000 Give 50000 Give 100000 These guys are living in poverty abroad. Let's get behind our missionaries. Amen? And finally, not only did Stephen preach about the movement of God, not only did he have the message of God, but he was martyred for God. In Acts 7, we find the account that's familiar to us. And we find that he stands on up. He sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. They're dragging him out of the sea. They begin to stone him. And the Bible simply says, Meanwhile, a witness, in verse 38, 58, Meanwhile, a witness laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep, and Saul was there giving approval to his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church of Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them into prison. However, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. You know, I was touched last night when George Gagana, 71 years old, came on up. And of course, he's going back to Tokyo to die there. He came on up and in tears in his prayers prayed to God, Spare my life till I see the world evangelized. That's going to be awesome. I got a hunch, just a hunch, honey, that God's going to do it. But you know, if we're going to restore New Testament Christianity, we want to restore New Testament joy. Amen? New Testament love. Amen? New Testament scriptures. Amen? We want to restore New Testament numbers. Amen? But when you do all that, you're going to restore New Testament persecution. There's a price. That's why a lot of people don't want to get too close to Boston. We're expensive friends. You know, I think for some people in that day, Stephen's commitment Frightening. Guy that stood up, told the whole cotton picking Sanhedrin they were uncircumcised and stiff necked. Resisting the spirit. And then he just looked up to heaven and says, Hey, I see Jesus too. Oh, mercy. You know, that kind of commitment is frightening. And then he, then he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. That kind of commitment is frightening. It's frightening. 
our brother Vincent over in the church in Paris, while singing and preaching in public, preaching in the campaign, was kicked in the groin, hit in the face, and asked by that non-Christian, what would Jesus do? And he said to the smile, he turned the other cheek. Bombay, they've been kicked out of homes, kicked off campuses, spit on. Their lives have been threatened several times. Not just in Bombay, but in Johannesburg. Not just in Johannesburg. I got news for you folks in Boston, Massachusetts. I've had a couple phone calls. And they weren't the good humor man. <laughs> Let me put before you a man has nothing to live for unless he's got something to die for. But why did Stephen die, Chip? He was an awesome preacher. He was powerful. But you know, God allowed him to die so he'd go to heaven, amen? But beyond that, by dying, he brought more souls in the kingdom than by living. He totally blew the mind of that guy, Saul. In Acts 22, it records that Saul still remembered Stephen's death. He never forgot how that Christian died. There was such a great persecution to all the Christians at the, at the challenge of the apostles and the prophets, not out of fear, but in a scattering of love scattered out in the virgin territory and preached the word wherever they went. More souls were won because the Christians were inspired by Stephen's death. One of their leaders was not afraid to die for Jesus. It convinced the Christians. It convinced the non-Christians. Jesus is Lord. There is something to die for. There is something to live for. I understood this so much more when Doug Lightning shared with me an account from South Africa. There was this woman, this Christian that got in a car wreck. It was a very bad car wreck. The fire trucks rushed to the scene. She was pinned inside the car wreck. The firemen were trying to take her out of the car with the jaws of life. One man in particular was trying to struggle and all of a sudden, the gasoline that had leaked out of the car caught fire. It quickly began to consume the car. The, the fireman had to back off. And he backed off and he saw the fire begin to consume the part of the car where the woman was at. And he, just, he was just trying to shield himself from the screams. And all of a sudden, he heard gospel songs. And the woman sang. The fireman went home that night, Doug tells me, haunted. He made several calls the next day. He says, which church does that woman belong to? And the answer came, the Church of Christ. <laughs> he got in touch with the church, and a few days later, he was baptized in Christ. He's your brother. <laughs> going to be a time and a place to pay the price of persecution. But it'll only more convince the Christians, and it'll even more convince the non-Christians. And yes, my friends, some of the high-profile people in here will be martyred like Stephen, or else the movement will not be preached every person. We've got to pay the same price. It doesn't come any cheaper in the 20th century. I know. I will not see a natural death. But you know, if you don't have something to die for, you don't have something to live for. Are you ready to die for Christ? The ones that didn't say anything, why do you resist the Spirit if it means more souls coming into the kingdom? Yes, Stephen preached a message, a movement of God, a message of God, martyred for God. That's the challenge tonight. In closing, Marianne Shaw Bisher wrote a poem. She was in a weaker discipling ministry. Now she's in Fort Lauderdale, really loving it there in that great ministry. But she wrote a poem when she was hearing all the things about Boston. And she sent me this poem. And she entitled it, The Movement. 
A moment, they call it. What a frightening word. Why does my soul shrink within? It looks like God's hand as it plays the trail, but my mind says, could it be sin? I see what they say. I study the word. It's hard to call them wrong. But I panic in fright as I wonder at night, what if this movement is wrong? The Spirit of God moved across the waters. Why doesn't that frighten me? Jesus chose a zealot to move his cause. Is that so hard to see? But that was Jesus, and that was God. And these, I remind you, are men. But watch how they sing and pray and repent. See how they rebuke their own sin. And they laugh and they love as they sell everything. And they see the hilarity of faith. Reckless, abandoned, as onward they go. Why do I envy these greats? Dirt bags, they say, and slum and refuse. It all makes me want to run. But as I watch and as I see, they're all having so much fun. Strong leaders, pillar churches, discipleship. Have they forgotten our rules? But why does my mind drift back to one man and a few that learned in his school? He went away. He is not here. His spirit lives in our hearts. But I'm so tired of trying alone. I feel like I'm falling apart. I need what they have, I have to confess. And I'll tell you another truth. I want it, I want it, I long to rise up. My best days cannot be my youth. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm gone. Sold out to the great cause of Christ. I hand my fears to you, Abba Fala. Your wisdom will have to suffice. She is the bride, she is your heart. Take care of her, I know you will. But as for me and my household, I join the cause with a thrill. Why do you resist the Spirit? Amen. God bless you.